What's going on, guys? We got a big announcement here on this channel. We are going to be launching the 50 50 show soon. We are going to be talking about current events, Asian culture, sneakers, basketball, all the things that you guys love from our channel, except just in a different format. But first, here's a podcast about us. Basically, today, we don't have a topic based list. Uh oh. Or maybe we do, but the topic is the Fung Bros perspective. Oh, and we got a list about it. We have some explaining to do. I think some people are kind of confused about our background, where our perspective comes from, how we're able to make so many different videos. 10 things you need to know about the Fung Bros that inform our perspective. These things will help you understand where we're coming from. It may not explain everything, but we're gonna try. Because we've been saying a lot of a lot lately, particularly obviously on Asian issues. A lot of a lot. Woo! Okay, David, start with number one. We grew up in a very educated family, but we weren't spoiled, nor would I say that we grew up with a lot of money, and we were definitely raised in a more blue collar town. Basically, our family, both our parents had graduate degrees. Yeah. Dad had a PhD, our mom had a JD. Educated in America. Doctorate. But we were raised in a town that was more blue collar in terms of, I guess, like socioeconomic level or educational level. So basically, your family stands out sort of like a sore thumb, even though you think yeah, it's like your family's just misaligned with the city that you grow up in. Our neighborhood, a lot of people in our neighborhood growing up, probably their parents didn't even go to college. And I would say even whether they were white, black, or Asian, actually, it just wasn't the most educated area. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just everybody was hardworking. Basically, we grew up with this nerdy academic Chinese family in sort of like a jock, urbanish part of town. Now, I wouldn't say that it was hood, but there was definitely some hood elements. No, there and was that's people who left the hood. It who moved to Kent. <laughs> and they kind of brought the hood with them. Um, yeah. There was some hood stuff that happened. Oh, I'll tell you this. There are very particular apartment complexes that where there's graffiti and everything like that. It feels like the hood. Usually educated parents like this would not raise their kids in a place that end up having, you know, some obviously some drug addiction, uh, drug violence, all this stuff. You know, a lot of like professional sports players come out of here. So I think it's just like, like you said, our family background just did not align with the environment and that causes for a lot of perspective and actually, it actually makes you kind of funny yeah it actually makes you funny because i'll tell you why everything your parents teach you at home does not necessarily vibe with what other kids parents teach you yeah. other kids values and even sometimes the teachers at your own school are so like blue collar centric they can't even help you dream of like whatever your coach to think of it at home. Well, you know, when our family's expectations, which, you know, coming from where we come from, I feel like we're a little bit maybe, you know, uh, overestimated, but their expectations were that we kind of go to like really good schools or Ivy League schools, but nobody from our area goes to Ivy League schools. Like, it's just hard. You know, like the, even the- uh, Valedictorians yeah, don't Yeah, even the Valedictorians or the high school uh, counselors, they don't even understand how to get there. So they're just like hoping you get to community college or like the state school. Anyways, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying like, that was kind of the misalignment that and, we're having in our family. And I think that when you kind of grow up in <clears throat> very blue collar and some people are even more like maybe lower middle class and stuff like that, you, you want to be down with the flow because the flow is the flow. Like if you're in a certain type of high school that you don't align with, you don't get to come in and be like, everybody adapts to you. You have to adapt to the current flow. I'm going to change the rules and bring my values to this school. You guys do not value academics enough. Well, let me tell you, shut up. Our sister ended up going to Stanford and she really didn't fit in with the vibe in Kent, right? So she kind of more did her own thing. Kept herself. Obviously, you know, if she had really adapted to the Kent culture probably she honestly she probably wouldn't have went to Stanford nah. but uh for me and you we more tried to adapt and we tried to get in with it and that was a great segue to point number two is pretty much even though we grew up around mostly non-Asians we didn't play the cut we were very involved we were out there we were trying to get with the flow and be popular kids of the flow we're involved in var varsity sports a lot of clubs um I think well known but maybe not like beloved but definitely well-known kids first of all there's different schools within a school district with like slightly different dynamics by the way there's schools with more asians or schools with less asians we went to a school that particularly had very little asians and of the asians that were there practically no like i guess east asians it was mostly like chinese and vietnamese and like filipinos there wasn't that many chinese people at least when i was there no 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 You're there wasn't you. there wasn't my year a little bit more uh just not that many though in my graduating class of 450 people 
there was seven Chinese people. And maybe 10 East Asians total. Yeah. Out of 450. Not a lot. That's crazy. We, we didn't grow up around our own kind. And we Whether all that did was, running start. Yeah. We all, we all <laughs> went to college and high Basically, school. Basically, it's like we didn't grow up around our own kind or people from an even similar socioeconomic level. And we were really trying to be cool at school. So we were trying to kind of, in a way, appeal to all these people who were unlike us. Not that that was the only thing. I mean, I think we thought all that stuff was cool too. You know, uh, dressing cool, playing ball, everything. Um, but definitely there was kind of like, yo, I'm trying to be cool. Well, you tr we tried hard yeah. to fit in. Yeah, without you. I think some people would go, well, that was very foolish of you to try to fit in when you were from this type of family to try to fit into uh, that flow. That was very foolish. And maybe to some extent people still think we're foolish. At the end of the day, things don't make or break you that young, uh -huh. but they definitely affect, they have an impact. Like I some people go to schools where everybody's family is like their yeah. family. Yeah. And then some people go to schools where it's half, half. And some people go to schools like us where almost nobody at the school has a similar background well, to your family. Even the other Asians didn't necessarily come from a similar background. We had, a, we had, we were managed to make some pretty good Asian friends, um, but their family backgrounds were even yeah. different. To wrap this point up is I think being in that environment was oftentimes more like a battleground than a playground growing up where we weren't just around our own kind. We weren't super, super comfortable and we were out there trying to make it happen, trying to adapt to the environment, uh, whether or not we should have, but we tried and that's what we did. And like we said, everybody has different reactions to it when they don't align with yeah. like an immediate environment. I, I do think it made us stronger though, overall, like for sure. For sure, and it informed like, our perspective too because a lot of people, they go through that process once they hit like 18, 20, maybe 23 yeah. when they're entering their corporate profession. Wow. We're going through that at 12, Let 13. Let me tell you this, dude, uh, from what I hear, a lot of the SoCal Asians that grow up in Asian areas out here, they, they learn that when they go to like, go to school in Boston or something then they get, you know, hit with the American brick. Like, hey man, this is what it's really like. Um, anyways, uh, point number three, Seattle is one of the most, if not the most educated cities in America, but it's a small place. Just to give you an example, growing up in Seattle, we had the Sonics, we had the Mariners, we had the Seahawks, but really the big celeb at that time that everybody knew the name of was Bill Gates. Yep. And that it, and that's like almost even amongst the non-academically focused people, Bill Gates was still the name because he was the richest man in the world. Yeah. And he's I'll say this like Microsoft. obviously because we had this very academic centric family, we did have access to the Seattle infrastructure. So on weekends we'd get taken to the Science Center, we get taken to the Asian Art Museum, all these different exhibits you know, variety of um, theater shows that were available because you're still close enough to Seattle. You can just drive in for a show. Yeah. You're not necessarily driving in when you're young to go hang out because it's not like we went to church in Seattle or anything like that. But I'm saying that um, there, it was really a weird push and pull because your local environment is like, everybody's trying to play for the Seahawks or the Sonics growing up. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekends, you're going to go see like, a talk by like a professor. Yeah. Or, or you're going to your see the new, you're going to see the new exhibit at the science center. That's going to talk about like physics and like the universe and stuff. Or you're going to go see an opera or you're going to go see a Chinese opera or like a, one of those Chinese like circus acts. Yeah. I got to tell you, I got to, I got to add this funny anecdote though. For one of my birthdays in sixth grade, I don't know if you remember this. I had a bunch of the guys over from, you know, from the school and we were having a sleepover, you know, mix. There was Richie there and some other people. And then one of the presents that dad got me was Stephen Hawkins book for my birthday. Oh yeah. And uh, not that I didn't like Stephen Hawkins at the time, but I would say definitely to open that present in front of everybody, like it was supposed to be lit. Uh, I don't know. I felt like a really weird feeling where I was like really embarrassed that dad did that. I appreciate like you, it you, now. You wanted like a N64. Right? Yeah, I wanted some shoes or something, but I think dad thought it was going to be dope to have me open that in front of my friends because that's what he valued. And at that time, of course, being a kid, I'm just trying to be cool, dad. You're going to be opening this book of Stephen Hawkins. That was crazy. But well, I don't think any of the other kids probably got that for their birthday. I, no, no. But... I, like I said, I appreciate it now, but that was like, anyways, that was like a funny little story. All right, guys, basically what we're saying is culture in Seattle is pretty different 
than culture in other places, okay? It's definitely more similar to I don't, SF. I don't think it starts to change to be like this kind of like, to me, what I call like a middle America culture until about federal way. Kent, just Kent starts to change too. But you know what I mean? Like yeah. Seattle has a very strong tractor beam of Dude. like, yo, if you're smart with computers, you could be rich. I mean, Bellevue has the highest density of millionaires in the world. Or at least in America, that's crazy. Um, and a lot of stock option millionaires there. Yeah, and just it's just different, man. It's really different. So that's why I, that's why we wanted to tell you how educated Seattle was because that colored our perspective and colored the values and you know some of the things that we did. Point number four: We grew up deeply influenced by the culture of New York, particularly New York hip hop and basketball culture. I don't think we need to talk too much about this because I feel like this one's a little bit more obvious for people, but we love New York and we always love New York rap. Particularly, you know, Lower East Side, yeah. Chinatown. We love And um, if you guys know about, I think it's funny because um, basically South Seattle's kind of like, at least the more closer you get to Seattle, it's very like Nas. Yeah, yeah, the South, you, South Side. You know why it's like Nas more than like Chief Keef? Definitely more Nas than Chief, Chief Keef. Because you have this street element, right? Which Nas is very street. But Nas is also a poet. And he's very much about reading yeah. books. Yeah. It's very like Nas Most Def. Nas Most Def were really big in Seattle. Retro Open Mic is essentially like a... No, it's a lot of that revolution, poetry show. revolutionary yeah. slam poetry. Yeah. Obviously, if you guys know about slam poetry, guys. Usually, if you're a slam poet, your favorite rapper is Nas. Yeah. Probably, yeah. right? Even the point before where we were saying it's so educated, it still seeps in to the culture in the urban parts of Seattle where people are a little bit more cautious, conscious. Hey, you know who's like that? That's from uh, really close to where we're from? Jamal Crawford. Yeah. And you know who else is from Seattle is Angela Rye. Yeah, the political uh, journalist pundit. She And they're all from South Seattle. Yeah. Um, around the Seward Park area. So it's like... South Seattle. We're from South Side. I know there's the South End. We're not from the South End. We're from the South Side. Anyway. But yeah, I mean, I, I think basically there's just a... If New York hip-hop fit really well into Seattle at that time growing up. It's not so much like trap rap. It wasn't really Atlanta rap. It really wasn't even LA rap. Of course, it being West Coast, there was a lot of Pac being played. But um, I would say Pac and Nas and Jay-Z, there was like... Maybe a little more Pac, but it was close. People just like lyrical stuff. They like lyrics. And they, and they sort of like, um, you know, if you know Nas, he picks a lot of rainy sounding beats. His beats sound very like gravelly. I mean, I'm not- Very minimalistic DJ, you know, premier type stuff. Guys, I'm not saying Macklemore represents all of Seattle, but the fact that Macklemore came from Seattle does mean something. Macklemore's still really He's lyrical. He's very lyrical and uh, kind of cheesy, but- Spoken word. Yeah, very poetic, you know. Like I said, you you got to give Macklemore that. I would say the biggest Seattle, South Seattle icons in terms of like the urban hip hop culture, Brandon Roy, Nate Robinson, Jamal, IT now. IT's from Tacoma, but yeah, that still counts. I'm Zach Levine is from North Seattle, but people don't really rep Zach like that. Anyways. But he does play in the crossover league. He does. Hey, he's one of the greatest dunkers ever. I'll give him that. Point number five that kind of informs our opinion is that we used to be really angry, angrier, and more bitter about the position of average Asian guys in America. And although there's always still things to talk about and issues there, things are getting better. But I feel like we've toned down some of the anger. Which some people I think might be surprised that we said that because lately we've just been like making some videos complaining. Not really complaining, identifying the issues, but guys. I feel like we're not angry about it. Nah. The tone is different. It's way more looking at it just from a technical how long are you going to be angry for? Like, that's my question to a lot of people is that, of course, it's totally fine. And basically, we should rewind that. To basically, to say this, I think if you're not super tall or super good looking or super rich and you're like an Asian guy in America, the odds are people are going to rank your Dragon Ball Z power levels pretty low. I would just say that the average Asian guy in the West, the average Asian guy probably gets ranked pretty low on the depth chart. Yeah. Unfairly, like yeah. literally, regardless. No, it's like it's like a of fact their, now. of their like built-in skills and talents and thoughts and abilities. Just straight off the yeah. rip, they're like socially ranked 
kind of low. Yeah. And what I would say is that we knew that early on. We kind of learned that. We felt that. Uh, we were on the message boards reading blogs about this long before Reddit really popped off as like the scene to do that in. And then I would say like, um, we, we've been talking about these issues for a long time. And for me personally, I'm just a little bit less angry, not because I have everything in my life that I want, but just because I'm like, yo, we got to just go out and attack things and do things because I'm like not as caught up at this point in my life in, oh my gosh, this is what happens. You mean Asian guys get ranked lower than other guys? Like, that's not new to me. That's just a fact. I've accepted it. So what do we do from here? Yeah. And, and we're not talking about the really chiseled, beautiful, you know, sharp nose Asian guys that some of them obviously exist. And, and, and yeah, I do think they get underrated. And I always tell people it's like an exchange machine. Yeah. What, you know, different people are getting different exchange rates on their efforts. Yeah. What's your exchange rate? What can you do except pump more dollars in? What's your machine like? Is your machine working properly? Is your change machine giving you the full amount one for one or is it kind of janky it's kind of giving you like well obviously it's, I, I can one. see why some guys could be discouraged if they put in a, a dollar bill right and some guys get five quarters back and then you feel like you're getting two quarters and like two dimes back 70 cents you're getting 70 cents on a dollar they're getting a dollar 25 on a dollar in terms you know of exchange rate yeah. guys it's discouraging we, yeah it is discouraging but, but i don't think the guy should stop trying i don't think that they should give up i think the reason why we wanted to share that point is because i basically wanted to let you guys know that we've been there we've been on the bitter boards if you want to call them the angry asian man we've kind of been there i'm not saying that i still don't feel it it's just that i'm i'm, I'm there in a different space now as you should be yeah as we all should be i think that it's really easy to stay in that like brooding period but at the end of the day your life actually only changes not when you accumulate more knowledge or a more profound understanding of your problems but actually you as you attack them as you take action so that's what i we want from all the makeover videos and all those things as uh encourage guys to relentlessly take action action instead of relentlessly accumulating a better understanding of the problems uh, David, are you active on the activeness? Basically, everything in life, guys, is a balance between attack and analyze. I do think Asians in general, not just the average Asian guy in the West, could use a lot more attack. Yeah. Number six, as Asian as we are, and we're very proud to be Asian, and we're very much into Asian history, culture, food, uh, the movement all happened, but we're not that much into like Asian pop things. It being Asian pop music, gaming anime like we we keep up with kind of all of it on like a base level i feel like but we're not like deep in it right that's fair and we're not i don't think that's a mystery i don't think people are like shocked i, I watched attack on titan but the one movie you yeah, watched the show no I, 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 i'm a i'm aware of the hey, premise hey, okay hey, but hey. yeah no, uh, no i i feel like you know it's important to understand what's going on the general view but we're i, I don't spend time i know enough it. to get very surface level anime memes but if we were going to like into the anime meme instagrams yeah a lot of that stuff would go over my no, head. no no the memes about anime that pop up on the mainstream asian instagram meme pages i kind of understand but the deeper ones i don't and i think it's funny because uh we had this one friend this one time it was she was a girl and uh who she was like hey guys uh you guys aren't really asian and I was just like, what do you mean we're not Asian? Look at us. Like, we, we talk about Asian food all the time. We're very proud. We're like, what do you mean? She's like, no, you guys aren't into, like, gaming and all that stuff. You know, the typical Asian stuff. So I think it's interesting. Um, and I'm not to, like, downplay that kind of stuff because I know that a lot of our friends are into it, too. But, like, I think it's just interesting that we're more into, like, probably the food, culture, history aspect of it all and the globalization and the economics behind it than we are necessarily into the pop culture you're talking about yeah sort of like the teenage pop culture of asia and um i still like boba though i just think that if you really look at asian culture in depth there's so many different levels and the pop culture that emerged in the past 20 years is just one narrow slice of asian culture yeah and um, I'm not, I like BTS, I'm glad BTS, I really liked the, the fact they were able to speak at the UN, garner that type of platform, but I'm not learning K-pop choreo routines. What? 
just in the same way I never learned Jay Chow choreo routine. So it's not like a Chinese versus Korean thing. Like I don't like pop music in general. But yeah, I mean, I think real quick, just to wrap up this point, because I, I don't think we need to explain too much, but like, why is that different? How does that shape our perspective that we're kind of more interested into the larger part, the thousand year old Asian culture, rather than diving so deeply and being caught up in the, like the last 20 years? Well, first years. of all, I think the people who actually really understand Asian culture, if you had to pick one or the other, for sure, all the other stuff is more deeper. Yeah, no, the history. I mean, we're talking about hundreds to thousands of years. I mean, we're talking about products that were created in the last 15, 20 years yeah. in the pop world. We're talking about philosophies that have lasted the test of time. Uh, and well, to hey, me, hey, later, let's just say 2,000 years versus 20 years. I mean, I guess last word on Asian pop culture that I'm not particularly deep in, whether it be anime, gaming, or pop music, it's like, I think it all is part of the wave. I think generally it's all good. Number seven, I wanted to say, share this point is that we never hit our identity of being Chinese. And we do believe that Chinese are often misrepresented in a kind of larger sense. So I feel like one of our goals of our channel, it's not that we are not actually, we don't have friends of other Asian races. We actually are very well versed, I would say, in other Asian cultures. But particularly there's kind of this uh, mission that we have to kind of, I don't know, help explain where Chinese are at right now. Yeah, I think it's a unique responsibility that only would fall on people who are Chinese. I have the passion for it. And I think that of all the Asians in America, Chinese are probably the most misunderstood. Yeah. Because it's the oldest, it's the oldest Asian, it's the oldest country actually in the world yeah. right now that's still a unbroken civilization mm -hmm. and the first uh, asians that came over to america like egyptians would be up there but yeah. guess what egyptians they ain't egyptians anymore like from they ain't the pharaoh egyptians right so basically chinese are sort of like this very esoteric group of people that a lot of people really struggle to understand i think even chinese americans don't understand it is complicated it's really complicated there's 56 different languages yeah. within it and actually, genetically, Chinese people are mixed with a lot of different things. Yeah. They're not all like what people would they're say. They're mostly Han. Han. They're mostly Han, but they're mixed with yeah. a lot of different stuff depending on what region, you know, you're. I mean, you're, China's a big place with yeah, a lot and, of and people. And it's grown over the years. Yeah. So it's um, not as cut and dry as being like an Asian from a small country. I think they're complicated in their own way, but it's pretty much like that's the narrative and that's it. You know what it is? For Chinese, it's like they can't even agree on what language to speak. I mean, it's a lot easier to kind of have a one set narrative for, for example, like maybe Koreans and Vietnamese people who, you know, their populations range, you know, less than 50 million worldwide. But then um, obviously with Chinese, with such a big, huge planet of their own. 1.35 billion? I mean, 1.4 if you count the diaspora of people from around the world easily, right? And it's just like, that's just a crazy amount of people with a crazy amount of history and- uh, and, and Diversity, I and, mean, it's like India. Yeah, if you look yeah. at India, the reason India has had some, you know, problems running infrastructure is because they're all super different from each other. Yeah. And some of them don't even speak the same language. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and uh, I, I would say, like, I think it struck us because I think so many Chinese kids growing so up, many like, Chinese people over the years. When we were growing up, a lot of Chinese kids wanted would, to be Japanese, wanted to be Japanese, wanted to be Korean or wanted to be white. Yeah. Or, or even wanted in, to be in the black. South End, in the South End. You know, it's more urban. Wanted to be Filipino. Yeah. I mean, they wanted to be everything but Chinese. Let's say that. Yeah. And this is, you guys have to understand, this is out of time. I think it's like different. If you're growing up in Australia right now and you're 15, you're probably really happy you're Chinese. I'm just saying like there was a time in the U.S., I would say a stretch of about 25, 30 years Dude. where it was viewed as so uncool to be Chinese. Yeah. No, you know how many Chinese people would just tell us like, uh, oh yeah, I'm just Asian. I'm like, when you, what, which Asian? You know, or like even if they are Chinese, they're like, oh yeah, they don't want to. They don't want to say which Chinese they are. Oh the yeah, province. My family's from the south. Where in the south? Like, you know, it's like I think just that there's that those people themselves they didn't fully understand how to use it and or how to be proud. And I think one of our missions is to this large group of people who maybe don't understand themselves that much. And I'm not saying I'm an expert. By all means, we're not experts. And I'm definitely not an expert. But I do think that we're trying to figure out a way that Chinese people can be proud without being 
ridiculous about it with being fair to everybody else with um just representing ourselves just more fully i i just think that one of the goals of our channel has always been to be well balanced asian guys to show all different asian cultures you know not represent them in ourselves personally but put them on camera give them a shot give some give them some shine but to also build up some more kind of like soft power imagery for the chinese culture yeah, and I'm not talking about anything geopolitical or no, anything related no. to any sort of just simply people just don't organization like, people. That's like why. yeah, it's just and, as simple as that. And I, it's like what I'm not gonna like my cousin. Our cousins are growing up over there. Yeah, like we have cousins growing up in China, yeah. Hong Kong, China, other parts of Asia too. Like, I don't want people to feel that way. I theoretically, if you made me analyze the reasons why they feel that way. I could break them down for you. Yeah. I get it. But somebody's got to just show some highlights, some at least some middle ground things. Trying to show that Chinese people can be nice people too. Yeah. And I get it. I get it. Chinese people, when you meet them anecdotally in your everyday life, unless you meet like kind of like certain ones that are, I guess, more less common, they're not going to necessarily be like the incredibly like smiley people. They it's could be, but I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah. Basically, I'm not saying, like, basically to wrap up this point is that we're not saying that there's not reasons for those questions or those debates and those stereotypes. Stereotypes come from somewhere. But I do think just as we do for Asians in general, we like to do, you know, even especially for Chinese is to just show the other side and show that we're more than those stereotypes. Number eight, we figured out early on that the world was tribal. And even though it's changing a bit now, it is still like that. Basically, this kind of understanding that people kind of like things that are similar to them, that's not a crazy thought. I think everybody should know that that's kind of true. On a macro level, on I macro think level. you're micro to mid situation like we always talking about where like boats or like fishes in the ocean and you are in control of to some extent how big or small or powerful or how your jeep or how your gps runs as a boat but then there's also a tide and a gravitational pull from the currents and the moon you know that you as a fish slash vessel in the ocean have no control over all you have is the control over how strong you are. Yes. And that's what it means to be tribe. People are tied to a tribe. Here's the thing. You don't get to fully pick what type of vessel you were born or what type of fish you were born. Why is it that any Asian YouTuber that's out there, the majority of their fans are Asian? Why is that? Because that's like what literally that's a fact for like 95% of Asian right. YouTubers. Well, obviously, I would say the only YouTubers that kind of have the benefit of multiple, multiple heavy demographics are the white YouTubers. Yeah. And that's why you see so many Asians or Latinos or even African Americans dye their hair blonde and wear blue contacts. Because at the end of the day, if you just look at it, let's remove all this sort of like social justice aspects out of it. If you want to appeal to the largest amount of demographic pools, having blonde hair and blue eyes is still probably the logical move. Even if you're Asian or even if you're, yeah, if, even if you're not white. Yeah, it just still helps just, just affect to, those attributes. To yes. look to have white features. Yeah. yeah. As far as the world being tribal, it's unfortunate. I think you look in 2019 right now and you see that on full display. I mean, you just take a look at polling numbers across america it's it's inland versus coastal it's this side versus that side like i can just know what someone's race gender and where they're born in america right now and with like 75 percent accuracy roughly predict which way they're leaning on a vote yeah yeah and i, I want to say it's just about race and looks though because different tribes they can it can be by socioeconomic and city for example in sf i think it's a little bit less based on being asian i think it's more about being from the tech world tech yeah. world you know obviously andrew yang's all of his followers are not asian in fact his biggest supporters are not asian so it's more about his meaning what he's doing for people people are are able to overlook right. even in england which for the longest time was a homogenous society they really segregated themselves based on which type of british accent you had oh do you speak yeah. the queen's english do you speak cockney yeah. do you have a birmingham uh, ham accent or whatever do you know what i mean like humans like to separate people into quadrants and then rank yeah. them into a hierarchy time i always said like anytime there's more than like 
six of a person, they're gonna start separating themselves somehow. You ever seen a group of like 10 friends and like they still have a ranking amongst that 10 oh. friends? They have the girl, the guy who's usually in the middle of the group. And then, you know, there's the guy who generally is always caught on the outside of the picture. And it's just funny. Anyways, it's like, people, a, soror it's like a sorority or a frat. I mean, yeah. they have a, there's hierarchy. Yeah, but uh, but I just think that that's just the way the world is. Not that I want it to be that way and not that it should be that way. But on a macro level now, I'm not saying in the mid and the micro things might not be different, though. Because it depends on your own individual situation, who's around yeah. you, what neighborhood you're living in, what part of that what city. What age you are, if you're really young, yeah. guess what? Tribes don't mean as much. Dude, living in different parts of Vancouver could feel like you're living in two different countries. Oh, yeah. Different parts of L.A. Number nine is that we generally care more about impact and meaning of a video more than income. So it's not that we don't value money. Of course, you know, everybody likes money. We, we like making money. Uh, we do brand deals, but it just doesn't take priority over kind of the type of videos that we want to make. For example, we've rarely ever hopped on trends. We never did like the mukbang thing. We never did like parodies really, like maybe one or two parodies. We've never really got into the reaction game. These are things that you do when you're essentially trying to make money off YouTube. And I think making money off YouTube is like the number two thing for us. But number one is like, what do we want to well, say? Well, you're referring to like the SEO games. The SEO games. We don't play the, and that's nothing wrong. I, the Google keywords. We have tons of friends that play those games that you're, they're just like, hey, it's like a formula. You to do this, tag it like this. You got to do whatever your friends want. No, literally, you, you stack like seven things on the formula together. You have a formula cake. But guess what? Guess what, everybody? The Fung Bros channel, I would say, lacks formula. Or the formula. It's just a lot different, I should say that. There's not a lot of internet gaming. Like, in, ter in terms of gaming, not gaming video games, like gaming the system. No, we don't. We don't game the system. It's hard, man. You know, we just want to make the content. It's funny because after all this time, David, almost eight years in the game of YouTube, we're still kind of like making the content that we just want to make. So in a way, as as I feel like as impersonal as our channel can be called because we don't talk about ourselves, you can see that... Topic wise, we just want to talk about the things that we want to talk about, whether it's an Asian issue video, one video, and then the next video is a food video, and the next one's a burger video, and the next one's about streetwear. It's like, it's very inconsistent, but it's interesting. That's how I say our channel is. You know, obviously you look back and you could say, oh man, I wish I would have did it that way, did it that way. Hey man, if it came, if we made it, you know, obviously there's a few vids I wish I could take back or like, I don't, I don't really grade the journey of the last eight years making professionally making videos online like a 10 out of 10. You know, hey man, who's to say the future couldn't be 10 out of 10 though? Yeah. Or at least striving for that. Not every video I want to say we've tried our hardest to be meaningful in, but if even if you watch the little grocery store videos, you know, we try to tie in a little deep takeaway at the end. We never did the cinnamon challenge. We never did ice yeah. bucket challenge. You know what it is? I, by the way, we do donate a lot of stuff, whether that's like- Oh, clothes, I, equipment. I got some microfinance accounts for you know third world entrepreneurs. I got, we donate a ton of stuff to Goodwill. Oh yeah. We'll throw up sneakers all around you, you know, New York, hey, Alhambra, I'm wherever. I'm supporting like, Indiegogo's and Kickstarters, man. We, we- uh, Oh, well, GoFundMe's when people have a- Because everybody's trip, going, everybody's make, going yeah. through it, you know? on some level or another, you know, relative to their own spectrum. But absolutely, I mean, I, you know, we were, we were, oh, one thing, we were raised pretty deep in the church. And yeah, I'll tell you this, I'm facts. not fully, you know, I don't even want to get into that too much. They, they coach you a lot on being caring. Yes, they coach you You receive a lot. a lot of heavy coaching on caring for um, your media community, your family, your friends, and even rings that extend yeah. out from on the tree stump. You know, Pluto, you still got to, you know, the sun, still got to care about Pluto, even though Pluto is so many rings removed from the sun. Now, is that even fully effective? As I'll tell you this, one thing I've realized is after meeting a lot of really, you know, and, and there's different types of rich people, after meeting some really rich, successful people, not every really successful person, at least in this game that I've met, like entertainment, that's the sun, cares about Pluto. You because, mean they don't care necessarily- Pluto's just a ball of ice, They don't apparently. necessarily care about the little people. Not or more the, than they have to. No, no. I think a lot and, of people... And there's just 
different coaching that everybody receives. I mean, going well, up look, look at our channel. It's like a, it's like partially like a community chain. Like I don't want to say we've just worked with so many different people, and we've tried to put so many people on and given them a shot to be on camera when a lot of other people don't want to like, don't even imagine that there's talent. Like there's always. We're bringing our friends into videos that really have no aspirations of being a YouTuber, right? Even our friends who are trying and, and it's not working out for them. Yeah, yeah. just help, you know. And it's not, I don't want to say it's just out of like, obviously I think we're going to get good content out of it too. So obviously that still helps, you know. David, point number 10. So David, what's one last thing you want people to know about the Fung Bros that might help them understand us better? I think the easiest way to put it is that the past eight years professionally doing YouTube, uh -oh. it's just been... Um, our search for the truth. It's not that we had it figured out eight years ago and it's not that we have it figured out now. There was just a lot more soul searching than we ever let on. And there was a lot more really in-depth discussions. And I think now in 2019, moving forward until, let me tell you this. Whoa. I think, and you cannot predict the future. You think, David thinks. Until lot. the day I stop doing this. Whoa. Whether that's when I die or at a previous prior date it's going to change basically that uh wraps it up for our top 10 list of things that you need to know about the fung bros to kind of understand why we make the videos that we do 2019 season of change a lot of things are moving guys uh say no more guys we're going to wrap up the podcast here thank you so much for watching or listening um, hopefully it helped you guys understand us better. You might still have some other burning questions. Uh, hopefully the comment section is popping. That's what I'm hoping for. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching that episode of the Hot Pop Boys Hot Podcast. Ah! That was 10 things about what makes us who we are, the Fun Bros. Yo, you guys, thank you so much for watching that podcast about us and what informs our perspectives. Hopefully you guys got a better idea of just where our minds come from. And if you guys liked any part of that podcast, definitely check out our 50-50 show coming soon on this channel. Stay tuned.